Are these not wonderful days which we are living with Abdu'l Baha in our midst? Our longing to see him was great, but much greater is the joy that our prayers were answered. A house was taken for Abdu'l Baha at 1815 California Street. As our assembly is composed of the friends in San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, and several adjoining towns, each day has been filled to the utmost, receiving friends and those interested in the movement, speaking to large audiences, giving talks in the parlors to groups of earnest seekers, and giving personal interviews to others. All alike are recipients of his favors. The afternoon of the day of his arrival, he crossed the bay to Oakland, where he met the friends at the home of Mrs. Helen Goodall. For 12 years, this home has been a meeting place, but on the afternoon of October 3rd, it became a memorable place, blessed by the presence of Abdul Baha. After a beautiful address, he took the children in his arms, kissed them and blessed them. They felt his love, even following him into the adjoining room. Friday evening, October 4th, he received many people at his home, people from all the cities about the bay, and after a short address, he greeted them, welcoming them to his home. Saturday from early morning, he met the friends, and in the evening attended the regular assembly meeting held each Saturday night at the Lick Building, Montgomery Street where a most wonderful talk was given. Sunday, October 6th, two public addresses were given, in the morning at the First Unitarian Church in San Francisco, and in the evening at the First Congregational Church in Oakland. Monday was also a busy day, with interviews, talks in the parlor, and in the evening, an address before the Japanese YMCA of Oakland. This was a most interesting occasion, for the words were spoken in Persian, translated into English by Dr. Farid, then from English into Japanese by Reverend Kazahira. It was a marvelous mingling of the East and the West and the islands of the sea. This morning, October 8th, Abdu Baha, accompanied by the friends from Persia and 15 others, including myself, are here at Stanford University where an address is about to be given before the student body. You can hear them now. 1,500 enthusiastic students waiting attentively for his address, the theme of which is the oneness of all phenomena. Let's go in now. President David Starr Jordan will be introducing him soon. It is our portion to have with us, through the courtesy of our Persian friends, one of the great religious teachers of the world, one of the natural successors of the old Hebrew prophets. He is said sometimes to be the founder of a new religion. He has upwards of three million people following along the lines in which he leads. It is not exactly a new religion, however the religion of brotherhood, of goodwill, of friendship between men and nations, that is as old as good thinking and good living may be. It may be said in some sense to be the oldest of religions. He will speak in Persian. He will be translated by Dr. Amin Farid, a graduate of the University of Illinois and also of Johns Hopkins University. I have now the great pleasure and the great honor also of presenting to you Abdul Baha.
You're listening to the Journey West podcast, dedicated to following the travels of Abdul Baha in the West. October the 8th, 1912. Talk at Leland Stanford Junior University. The greatest attainment in the world of humanity has ever been scientific in nature. It is the discovery of the realities of things. Inasmuch as I find myself in the home of science, for this is one of the great universities of the country and well known abroad, I feel a keen sense of joy. The highest praise is due to men who devote their energies to science. And the noblest center is a center wherein the sciences and arts are taught and studied. Science ever tends to the illumination of the world of humanity. It is the cause of eternal honor to man, and its sovereignty is far greater than the sovereignty of kings. The dominion of kings has an ending. The king himself may be dethroned, but the sovereignty of science is everlasting and without end. Consider the philosophers of former times. Their rule and dominion is still manifest in the world. The Greek and Roman kingdoms, with all their grandeur, passed away. The ancient sovereignties of the Orient are but memories, whereas the power and influence of Plato and Aristotle still continue. Even now, in schools and universities of the world, their names are revered and commemorated. But where do we hear the names of bygone kings extolled? They are forgotten and rest in the valley of oblivion. It is evident that the sovereignty of science is greater than the dominion of rulers. Kings have invaded countries and achieved conquest through the shedding of blood. But the scientist, through his beneficent achievements, invades the regions of ignorance, conquering the realm of minds and hearts. May you attain extraordinary progress in this center of education. May you become radiant lights, flooding the dark regions and recesses of ignorance with illumination. Inasmuch as the fundamental principle of the teaching of Baha'u'llah is the oneness of the world of humanity, I will speak to you upon the intrinsic oneness of all phenomena. This is the one of the abstruse subjects of divine philosophy. Fundamentally, all existing things pass through the same degrees and phases of development, and any given phenomenon embodies all others. An ancient statement of the Arabian philosophers declares that all things are involved in all things. It is evident that each material organism is an aggregate expression of single and simple elements and a given cellular element or atom has its coursings or journeyings through various and myriad stages of life. For example, we will say the cellular elements which have entered into the composition of a human organism were at one time a component part of the animal kingdom. At another time they entered into the composition of the vegetable, and prior to that they existed in the kingdom of the mineral. They have been subject to transference from one condition of life to another, passing through various forms and phases, exercising in each existence special functions. Their journeyings through material phenomena are continuous. Therefore, each phenomenon is the expression in degree of all other phenomena. The difference is one of successive transferences and the period of time involved in evolutionary process. For example, it has taken a certain length of time for the cellular element in my hand to pass through the various periods of metabolism. At one period, it was in the mineral kingdom subject to changes and transferences in the mineral state. Then it was transferred to the vegetable kingdom where it entered into different grades and stations. Afterward, it reached the animal plane, appearing in forms of animal organisms until finally in its transferences and coursings, it attained to the kingdom of man. Later on, it will revert to its primordial element state in the mineral kingdom, being subject, as it were, to infinite journeyings from one degree of existence to another, passing through every stage of being in life. Whenever it appears in any distinct form or image, it has its opportunities, virtues, and functions. As each component atom or element in the physical organisms of existence is subject to transference through endless forms and stages, 
possessing virtues peculiar to those forms and stations, it is evident that all phenomena of material being are fundamentally one. In the mineral kingdom, this component atom, or element, possesses certain virtues of the mineral. In the kingdom of the vegetable, it is imbued with vegetable qualities or virtues. In the plane of animal existence, it is empowered with animal virtues. The senses, and in the kingdom of man, it manifests qualities peculiar to the human station. As this is the true of material phenomena, how much more evident and essential it is that oneness should characterize man in the realm of idealism, which finds its expression only in the human kingdom. Verily, the origin of all material life is one, and its termination likewise one. In view of this fundamental unity and agreement of all phenomenal life, why should man in his kingdom of existence wage war or indulge in hostility and destructive strife against his fellow man? Man is the noblest of the creatures. In his physical organism, he possesses the virtues of the mineral kingdom. Likewise, he embodies the augmentative virtue or power of growth, which characterizes the kingdom of the vegetable. Furthermore, in his degree of physical existence, he is qualified with functions and powers peculiar to the animal, beyond which lies the range of his distinctive human mental and spiritual endowment. Considering this wonderful unity of the kingdoms of existence and their embodiment in the highest and noblest creature, why should man be at a variance and in conflict with man? Is it fitting and justifiable that he should be at war, when harmony and interdependence characterizes the kingdoms of phenomenal life below him. The elements and lower organisms are synchronized in the great plan of life. Shall man, infinitely above them in degree, be antagonistic and a destroyer of that perfection? God forbid such a condition. From the fellowship and commingling of the elemental atoms, life results. In their harmony and blending, there is ever newness of existence. It is radiance, completeness. It is consummation. It is life itself. Just now the physical energies and natural forces which come under our immediate observation are all at peace. The sun is at peace with the earth upon which it shines. The soft breathing winds are at peace with the trees. All the elements are in harmony and equilibrium. A slight disturbance and discord among them might bring another San Francisco earthquake and fire. A physical clash, a little quarreling amongst the elements as it were, and a violent cataclysm of nature results. This happens in the mineral kingdom. Consider, then, the effort of discord and conflict in the kingdom of man, so superior to the realm of an inanimate existence. How great the attendant catastrophe especially when we realize that man is endowed by God with mind and intellect. Verily, mind is the supreme gift of God. Verily, intellect is the effulgence of God. This is manifest and self-evident. For all created things except man are subjects or captives of nature. They cannot deviate in the slightest degree from nature's law and control. The colossal sun, center of our planetary system, is nature's captive, incapable of the least variation from the law of command. All the orbs and luminaries in this illimitable universe are, likewise, obedient to nature's regulation. Our planet, the Earth, acknowledges nature's omnipresent sovereignty. The kingdoms of the mineral, vegetable, and animal respond to nature's will and fiat of control. The great bulky elephant, with its massive strength, has no power to disobey the restrictions nature has laid upon him. But man, weak and diminutive in comparison, empowered by mind, which is an infulgence of divinity itself, can resist nature's control and apply natural laws to his own uses. If the animals are savage and ferocious, it is simply a means for their subsistence and preservation. They are deprived of that degree of intellect which can reason and discriminate between right and wrong, justice and injustice. They are justified in their actions and not responsible. When man is ferocious and cruel toward his fellow man, it is not for subsistence or safety. His motive is selfish advantage and willful wrong. 
It is neither seemly nor befitting that such a noble creature, endowed with intellect and lofty thoughts, capable of wonderful achievements and discoveries in sciences and arts, with potential for ever higher perceptions and the accomplishment of divine purposes in life, should seek the blood of his fellow men upon the field of battle. Man is the temple of God. He is not a human temple. If you destroy a house, the owner of that house will be grieved and wrathful. How much greater is the wrong when man destroys a building planned and erected by God? Undoubtedly, he deserves the judgment and wrath of God. God has created man lofty and noble, made him a dominant factor in creation. He has specialized man with supreme souls, conferred upon him mind, perception, memory, abstraction, and the powers of the senses. These gifts of God to man were intended to make him the manifestation of divine virtues, a radiant light in the world of creation, a source of life and the agency of constructiveness in the infinite fields of existence. Shall we now destroy this great edifice and its very foundation, overthrow this temple of God, the body social or politic? When we are not captives of nature, when we possess the power to control ourselves, shall we become captives of nature and act according to its exigencies? In nature, there is the law of the survival of the fittest. Even if man be not educated, then according to the natural institutes, this natural law will demand of man supremacy. The purpose and object of schools, colleges, and universities is to educate man and thereby rescue and redeem him from the exigencies and defects of nature and to awaken within him the capability of controlling and appropriating nature's bounties. If we should relegate this plot of ground to its natural state, allow it to return to its original condition, it would become a field of thorns and useless weeds. But by cultivation, it will become fertile soil, yielding a harvest. Deprived of cultivation, the mountain slopes would be jungles and forests without fruitful trees. The gardens bring forth fruits and flowers in proportion to the care and tillage bestowed upon them by the gardener. Therefore, it is not intended that the world of humanity should be left to its natural state. It is in need of the education divinely provided for it. The holy heavenly manifestations of God have been the teachers. They are the divine gardeners who transform the jungles of human nature into fruitful orchards and make the thorny places blossom as the rose. It is evident then that the intended and especial function of man is to rescue and redeem himself from the inherent defects of nature and become qualified with the ideal virtues of divinity. Shall he sacrifice these ideal virtues and destroy these possibilities of advancement? God has endowed him with a power whereby he can even overcome the laws and phenomena of nature. Wrest the sword from nature's hand and use it against nature itself. Shall he then remain its captive, even failing to qualify under the natural law which commands the survival of the fittest? That is to say, Shall he continue to live upon the level of the animal kingdom without distinction between them and himself in natural impulses and ferocious instincts? There is no lower degree nor greater debasement for man than this natural condition of animalism. The battlefield is the acme of human degradation, the cause of the wrath of God, the destruction of the divine foundation of man. It is my hope that you who are students in the university may never be called upon to fight for the dust of earth, which is the tomb and sepulcher of all mankind, but that during the days of your life, you may enjoy the most perfect companionship one with another, even as one family, as brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, associating together in peace and true fellowship. Now to our round table discussion. Hello, my name is Joseph, and I'm a history teacher. Hello, my name is Amelia from New Zealand, and I'm fresh out of high school. 
looking to do for the studies? Hello, my name is Anthony, and I am an artist. It was an interesting setting for him to be giving this talk because it's among academics at uh, Sanford University. So he focuses so much of the talk on the sciences and kind of the scientific knowledge of the day and how praiseworthy it is. And it's only really, it's over halfway through his talk that he begins to shift the shift his thoughts towards you know di essentially divine science or the idea that um th there's a spiritual element that is needed in order to um keep science from essentially being uh all knowledge essentially being wasted in a way because his idea of it'll end up you'll end up thinking about things at the um the level almost of the animal instead of, 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 of the more elevated station that humanity has. Start wasting your talents on things like um, warfare, which is kind of another one of the, the themes here of why would we waste all of our wisdom on, you know, that we have and all this new technology and new sciences and thinking and then find new ways to kill each other. That's not the purpose of why we have these gifts and talents it should be to help society and to help society progress, not to kill each other. Oh, I agree. I, I've always in, admired Abdul Bahar's ability to talk to the listeners and talk in a language that they will understand. And it is obvious, especially from the first part of this talk, that he's talking to, you know, basically people that are studying science. So it's it's he's taken the scientific approach. And I've noticed throughout this talk and many other talks that depending on his audience, he may be saying very similar things, but from different approaches. And whereas this, uh, the essential nature, which is the, uh, the essential meaning of this talk, or the purpose of this talk, is um, referring, I think it talks a lot about the unity of mankind and the oneness of humanity, really. It's interesting to, s to note that he begins with this idea from ancient Arabian philosophers that all things are uh, involved in all things, and the idea of everything is interconnected with each other. Cause, because um, he then lists examples of all of the recent scientific developments in that time, and these ideas of you know, understanding of molecular science, the understanding of how everything, you know, cells and molecules and things are all, you know, we have all these building blocks f for life and for um, the various, you know, kingdoms, mineral, animal, vegetable, human. And, you, you know, he's using this idea, though, that everything's still interconnected. And the focus of trying to break things apart, is, you know, looking at all the individual parts, he's trying to, in, I guess, in a way, see how still everything is connected at, at all, as, as a whole. It's um, instead of focusing so much on our differences, looking for that interconnected similarity between everything. He refers to it as the intrinsic oneness of all phenomena and how everything passes through the same degrees and phases of development, whether it's a plant or a mineral or a man, and that everything has these phases and progression. Everything leads into it to another, which I find very interesting. Even today, there's much talk about how all the ecosystem and different food chains, how all the different organisms, man, they all affect each other so much. If you can cut out this link or have small unbalances in any of them, it can make a huge effect on the whole. So, Dubaha really highlights the divinity or the, the divine station of humanity when he says that all things except for man are, are uh, subjects or captives of nature and that we're really beginning to see how man has, has the ability to control it, to control nature, manipulate it, um, taking things that were very unknown and mysterious about nature and beginning to understand it for the first time and 
being able to do things like create light through electricity in the incandescent lamp, or at this point in history, people are beginning to fly for the first time, which defies the law of nature. Or submarines, I think he mentions as well later on, the idea of, you know, we can fly in the air, we can go under the oceans. Man, which is a very fragile physical creature, is, is learning how to harness these other realms below us in order to be able to rise above them in a very physical way. Yeah, one of the differences with man and other beings or life forms is how, as you say, they control the environment and adapt it to suit themselves, whereas other animals have to make their own physical or behavioural changes to survive in the environment. Yeah, and you see it today. The, as science is progressing, a greater and greater level of environmental manipulation is made possible. And that obviously has positive and negative effects. Um, I guess with great power comes great responsibility. And uh, we're not always the, the best custodians of that power. And uh, you see a lot of damage is obviously done to the environment through irresponsibility. And it's an interesting concept that we've been given a capacity and with capacity, generally, we give the more greater your capacity, the more greater you have your ability to do both good and bad with it. And it draws back to that theme of unity because there are so many more people in the world today, and we're all using these advanced technologies, and we're all um, striving to improve our own personal lives. But at what cost? If the environment is being damaged in such a way, it's up to humanity as a whole, united, to be able to, as you said, be custodians for that. Yes, it's our obligation to carry forward an ever-advancing civilization and what way we can. God, we were created rich and in the hidden words, I created thee rich, rich, wherefore dost thou abase thyself? And in one way we could be abasing ourselves by over-exploiting this capacity that we have and the abilities of our mind to over-exploit the environment or damage things. It's interesting he's got this section in here about the purpose of schools and the purpose of education. He says the purpose and object of schools, colleges, and universities is to educate man and thereby rescue and redeem him from the exigencies and defects of nature and to awaken him with the capacity of controlling and appropriating nature's bounties. So it's kind of a reminder of what the purpose is of education. But then later on, he talks about the greatest educator being the divine educator, being the manifestations of God, and that that education is crucial for mankind to be able to progress and move forward. Something interesting to me was the, how he talked about how all the elements are in harmony and equilibrium and mentioning about environmental catastrophes that can happen and it's really lately in the world maybe it's just me but it seems there's been so many earthquakes or tsunamis and disasters and you think boy is this just because the media helps transport the information around the globe quicker that we hear about it or is it because there's something on a spiritual level or due to man's behavior that it's also reciprocating on the environment and things that happen. There's a part here where he talks about man is the temple of God. He's not a human temple. If you destroy a house, the owner of that house will be grieved and wrathful. How much greater is the wrong when man destroys a building planned and erected by God? Undoubtedly, he deserves the judgment and wrath of God. And I feel this talks about like the nobility of man and the sheer barbaric nature of harming another individual when you think about it. It's so much more greater than 
So he's like destroying a house. You know, this is a person that's created by God and, and yeah, has such a noble and high station. And one of those teachings that he brings up, that is brought up, said it already had been 50 years since Baha'u'llah had talked about the necessity of peace among the nat nations and the idea of reconciliation amongst all the people because of the fact that they all come from the same source and that all people are essentially one humanity, which was such a radical, it's even a radical thought by today's standards to think about. But certainly back then it would have been a very radical um, statement to make that we were all actually brethren and that we're, you know, this idea of destroying one another is like destroying your own brother. It's destroying your own relative. And it's, it was such, it still is such a foreign idea to, because of this idea of us versus them this, that we still have in society. Um, Abdul Baha later on in the talk mentions the idea that all these boundaries we've created, especially national boundaries and racial boundaries, are artificial. They're created by man's own imaginings. They don't actually exist. Um, and it only serves to divide us, not unite us. We can even go as far to say that all the virtues that human possess are all the qualities of God that he bestows upon us through our bounties and we can only gain strength and develop ourselves through prayer and feeding off God's manifold bounties. And by these qualities that we have, it's you can even think, boy, how could I destroy another being? I'm, in an essence, destroying one of God's creatures. And in accord to how people have created the boundaries between each other. It's amazing that in the talk it was noted how all the in religions have the same essence of creating sort of world unity and living in accord with one another. And it's puzzling why all of them can't understand that they have a similar motive and to try join unite forces I think you see this like uh, the central aspect of unity arising and it's more than just a unity of nations it's really a unity of science a unity of thinking a unity of religion and science and religion and how that often in the past these things have developed separately as in countries have developed on their own and uh, now this day and age religion and science is coming closer together and people's lives uh, we're becoming closer as a people and with and science and technology is helping push that and it needs to be within the the guiding lights of religion as well so that way that our scientific process progress is not uh, purely dedicated to materialism because we all know that the more materialistic a country becomes, it doesn't not necessarily the more happy and fulfilled people become. If anything, it can go in the opposite direction. So it needs to have this twin process of science and religion progressing and developing. And also it needs to be everywhere, all over humanity. It can't just be in one country or the other. And as countries work together more and as these artificial barriers are eventually dissolved and science and religion work closer together, we'll get a more holistic approach and a growth in humanity. That's it for our podcast this week. Special thanks to Jeffrey Marks and Ed Sebzik for participating in our feature. Also thanks to our reader and roundtable guests, David Renna, Joseph Wagner, Amelia Smith, and Anthony Hancock. If you'd like more information about Abdu'l-Bahá's travels in the West, visit our site, www.thejourneywest.org. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at The Journey West. Thanks, everyone. Bye.